So we're going to conclude our study in Macbeth today before going on to Lear. And um, Act 5 is the, obviously like all Shakespearean plays, the conclusion of the drama in which the themes um, and the characters that had been uh, established in the very beginning draw to a conclusion and pull together very neatly. And this is always the case with Shakespearean drama. I said to you that uh, Shakespeare ends his plays with a strong sense of what you might call closure in which the plot has resolved itself. And that strong resolution, which we don't always find in life, uh, reinforces Shakespeare's theological emphasis that, that God is sovereign and there is an orderliness to life even when it seems to militate against his order. And in fact, that's exactly what the play Macbeth has done, is it suggests that there is a rebellion at the highest level to the point of uh, executing the king, God's vice regent on earth, and unloosed a whole a chain of unnatural events. This is a, a violation of covenant, of kinship, of, uh, of fidelity, and so forth. Remember, Macbeth slays his kinsman, not just his king, and also his guest. So if you look at things from the perspective of Dante, this is the most heinous act he could commit. This is treachery. Uh, and uh, it would find him right at the bottom of Dante's Inferno. And what, what Shakespeare has been at pains to demonstrate is that that has immediate consequences for uh, Macbeth himself. He is not able to enjoy his power or uh, live afterwards like he did before. He can't just move into it. There's, he, he's not just able to do what we unfortunately have foolishly assumed that we can do uh, in life, which is to act pragmatically. And let me just say a little bit about pragmatism, because pragmatism is very much of an Anglo-American philosophy. And it's predicated on certain ideas that are very foreign to Shakespeare's world, would not occur to him, per se, or his audience. And this is one of the things that Shakespeare most dislikes about Machiavelli, is that he seems to recommend that kings act pragmatically. And I see it all the time in Christian circles and in business circles, pragmatism, which means that there's a certain outcome in view and the means justify the ends because life is effectively one in which uh, living wisely means being pragmatic. And pragmatism is concern, considered in materialist terms. Now, pragmatism as a philosophy rises in the 19th century. You can see it not uh, having exactly the same tenor, but very much uh, in sync with the British philosophy called utilitarianism, John Stuart Mill and company. <coughs> and uh, w when it obtains a, a philosophical expression, it starts to be strongly associated with the human sciences. Um, what Mill calls a, a pain and pleasure calculus And that phrase, uh, that term calculus at the end is very much in keeping with the human sciences because it wants to quantify pain and pleasure <clears throat> and regards as good politics what will give the greatest measure of pleasure to the people and the least pain. That would be a pragmatic philosophy. That would be the one that you would follow. And um, it would have no concern for the means, that would be irrelevant. And it also wouldn't concern, wouldn't think about individuals. It would think of the group. Now, this philosophy is very appealing to Marxists as well, who conceive of everything in materialist cons uh, considerations, and for whom ideas like God and human nature and individuality are irrelevant concerns. Marxism is very mil mil millenarian secular philosophy, and it posits the idea of a utopia, um, 
<coughs> achieve through material means. And you'll see that being represented in the human sciences in various ways, like Abraham Maslow's hierarchy of human needs, where, where the most basic needs, the ones that do the greatest possible good, are those that deal with creature comforts. You've done Maslow, right? In some class, like they put, they would never talk to you about Aristotle or Socrates, but they'll give you Abraham Maslow as if this was a basic, and everybody looks at it and says, oh yeah, that's, that's, that's the way it is. Let me put this Maslow. Not nursing. Might be interesting to see what the nursing, or actually I just want image. See if I can. There you go. That's as good as anything. Open in new tab. Oh, please tell me it's done that, and not done some crazy thing. Open image in new tab. Okay. Did it do it? No, just like the other one. Okay, so let me just stick with this one then. So the most basic needs are breathing, food, water, sex, sleep, homeostasis, excretion. Uh, physiological needs, bodily creature ones, those are the ones that are going to do the greatest possible good because it's the broadest framework, right? It's, the, it's like it's seen as a hierarchy, not just a hierarchy, but a pyramid. Now, contradistinguish this hierarchy from Shakespeare's notion of hierarchy in which the hierarchies are actually microcosms and macrocosms. So there's an analogy of things here, whereas this is not presented as an analogy, but it, a, an analogous form of hierarchy, but rather a, a basic one. You need this foundation to move to, up to the next foundation. And of course, the very top of these uh, things will involve freedom and morality and so forth. These, what, which he calls self-actualization, are at the, at the height of that. Note that Jordan Peterson and his self-authoring software is dealing with the ones at the top of the pyramid, but he presumes that the other ones at the bottom are the, at the bottom of the hierarchy, and of course it fits also with the Darwinian account of reality in which all creatures meet their physiological and safety needs first, and then they move on to the other things. But Shakespeare's notion of hierarchy involves love, and love is conceived to shoot through the entire hierarchy from top to bottom. It's not at the top of it, you get to love the, f the free love of the good only after you've satisfied all the other ones. It's, it's, it's through the bodily as well as the spiritual. Love is intrinsic in all of these uh, relations, in all hierarchies. But the materialist, pragmatist, utilitarian view says, sees it rather in terms of body being more central, more common, and therefore better public policy than the spiritual intellectual needs. That this is the one we assume. I say this because I talked to you at the outset of the course on Shakespeare's notion of hierarchy, and I realize that we, we too have an idea of hierarchy. It's just the hierarchy is actually inverted in some ways because the greatest possible good is done when we look after safety and bodily comfort. Every politician goes after that because it, it appeals to the largest number of people. And it doesn't consider what human nature is like. And as I say, things like love or self-actualization, these things are, are called psych psychological. We just simply assume Maslow is correct. And when we read Shakespeare, we can misunderstand that's what's going on here. And one of the reasons we might think that it is so is because when it comes to discussions about, or his presentation of what happens as a result of uh, Macbeth's heinous act in killing the king, we see violations in the natural order that r represent the same sort of perversion happening. It just spills over. And it even spills over into Macbeth's own individual life and that of his wife. And we began Act 5, Scene 1, with looking how it resulted for Lady Macbeth. She goes mad. She can't rid herself of the idea of the moral atrocity she's committed. She can't get rid of it. Out, out damn spot. She can't get it gone. And that's because, again, in Shakespeare's world, 
this is not the hierarchy, it's that there's a hierarchy that we see in analogous form running all through the great chain of being. And I presented it at the outset, and, and one of them is that the human person is a microcosm of all of those other things, an individual. So if you take out the king who represents God, you're taking out your own reason, the head of your individual self. You've decapitated yourself by doing this. It's an immoral act. Your moral nature has also been violated. And so perforce, your physical nature will also collapse in some ways. And he's going to display that in seeing uh, the king's horses eat one another and a, a smaller bird of prey going after a larger bird of prey, just like Macbeth went after the king. Got him drunk first, etc. So that is being displayed there, and I, I, I think that's actually quite helpful to clarify a different form of hierarchy than the one that we presuppose. And I say we presuppose it because we've been taught by pragmatists to think pragmatically and think that pragmatism is what real, being real and living in reality means. And if that's true, then Marxism becomes a great obvious solution, which has now become the case in the Anglo Anglosphere in the US and in Britain and in Canada. Because we're effectively materialists. And we judge good policy, good conduct by material outcomes. And you can even put a dollar value on it. And so people will appeal to how well is the government doing? Well, what's the gross domestic product and so forth? That's the it's the economy, stupid. That determines good politics and bad politics. Never occurs to Shakespeare, you see. They have no talk about economics uh, as a consideration. It's not that it's irrelevant. It's just that it's not at the forefront of their minds where it is in ours. OK, just I think that's helpful. Maybe you don't. Any comments or questions there? You ever heard this? I think we are all, almost implicitly pragmatists in the church as well. And therefore, we put in positions of eldership uh, people who are successful businessmen, mistaking material wisdom or ability to be successful in that sphere with spiritual wisdom. And they could, you could have both, but the one is very different than the other and will lead the church in a very different direction. Very unwise. Very unwise, and we wonder why people, why the church is in serious trouble. Yes, comment or question? He, yes, thank you. Yes, that's good. So C.S. Lewis in The Four Loves talks about each love being, first of all, they're all called love, right? And so they are types of love. But there's a hierarchy even within the loves. So just to reiterate for those of you who haven't, who haven't read C.S. Lewis's The Four Loves, uh, do you want me to write this on the board? Do you, does everyone have The Four Loves in their mind? Or do you want me to write it? Write it? Yes. OK, so let me do that. So those four loves, can you see this? No, you can't, so I'll just stick it over. So there you go, now you can't. 
those four loves, and there is a hierarchy there. Sort of a, 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 an equivalent of Maslow's hierarchy of human needs, because the one that's familial, storge, we share, and it relates to things that are around us. They can even be inanimate objects. It's our favorite place to be, our favorite armchair, our favorite music. It, it's familiar to us. It's all around us. We don't think about it, per se. It's comforting. It's very important to human life that, they, that we have familiarity with our surroundings. It makes us relax and, and be able to enjoy life. We have, a, we have bodies, we have souls, and we are relational beings, social beings. We bear the image of God. There's a social nature, and this reflects that. So that's a form of love. We talk about this, oh boy, I love this food. It's my favorite. Right? And each of these four loves, by the way, so there is a hierarchy, and each of them can be disordered, by the way, as well. Lewis will talk about that. I'm not going to go through Lewis's whole four loves here. I'll do that on the C.S. Lewis course. But above that, there's another type of love. And when Lewis says this, he's not making this up. He's doing a historical survey of the word love and how we attribute certain things to it. Now, in studies and words, he talks about different words and gives a whole etymology of the word and how it develops over the course of time. Here he devotes an entire book to love. This is a very difficult doctrine very complicated and it has many forms. And here are the four main ones though. So after familiar, there is friendship, much esteemed in the ancient world. They think it's maybe the highest form of love. That would be Socrates and Plato. The classical, the ancient world, the pagans highly regarded friendship because it's voluntary association. You associate with people that love the same things that you do. You don't you don't love the people per se, you love what you share in common. And, but there's a shared interest. He talks about it being side by side, looking at the same thing or working to the same ends. And those are your friends. And, and you can add to them almost infinitely. You can have as many friends as you want because it's, it, it's not about uh, the, the relational in that sense. You're looking at the other person, you're looking at together. Well, you can have a huge crowd. These are your friends. The supporters are your football team. Those are your friends. You act like you, know, you're, you are totally united in that. And all of these can go the wrong way, by the way. But, but let's just, for the purposes of here. The next form is romantic. He talks, talks about his eros. That's the subject of most uh, of Western literature and art. Whether it's a, in a romance or a comedy like Shakespeare's, or whether it's dealing with the tragedy of uh, disordered love. Uh, Macbeth loves honor, and he wants the highest honor, and he's going to be willing to use any means to get it. It's a, it's a disordered form of love. But romantic love does concern itself with the object. I love my wife because I think she's beautiful and good, etc., etc. It's she that I love, she in particular that I love. That's the source of romantic love, and it's exclusive. The second friendship is inclusive. You can include as many as you want, they just have to like the same things or love the same things. Whereas romantic love is exclusive. It's just for this person only. And when you add to it, then you take away from it. You can say, well, I can have multiple partners, etc. Yes, but there's something lost in this, and, and you're mistaking the, the whole person in this, or you're not valuing the person that you love sufficiently if you're willing to add to it and think that you're getting more out of it. Uh, finally, and, and, the, and the bottom three Lewis notes are actually all related to the top form, and yet they're also very different. So the bottom three are related to the worthiness of the object. I love my chair because it's the most comfortable chair that was ever made. I love my city because it's the best place, right? So I think there's something good in the object. Uh, friendship, my friends love the best thing. We all love this football team because it's the best. It's our team, it's yes. And, and those other teams, ah, we gotta, be, we gotta trounce them because they're terrible. So, right, but we think the object of love is the same thing with your lover your wife, your husband, she is the best 
for me. And, I, and I'm not even going to consider anything. So, ex, so the merit of the object is in view in that which you love. The fourth one, charity, agape love, is not like the others. And yet it norms all the others, Lewis argues. And this is what scripture talks about, the love of God. There's a Sesame Street song. Which one of these is not like the others? You know that? And you have to figure out which one of them. It's pretty easy. Um, but, and you have to do it before the song is done. You have to decide, and then you say, okay. This is not like the others at all. Charity, even though it's called love, so there's the commonality, is not like the others because it has no regard for the merits of the object at all. In fact, it's the exact opposite. God's love, he loved us while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. What manner of love is this? It's a question in scripture. And the reason they asked the question is because they were aware of how different, how radically other God's love is compared to human loves. We don't, God doesn't love us because we're lovable. He loves us because he is love. And he demonstrates his love by denying himself. Loving what is unlovable, etc. Now that attitude of love transforms, Lewis argues, all of the other forms of love. And to some degree, a study of Western literature, like I teach here, will demonstrate that the agape love of God, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, will change all the other forms of love. They will be normed by his love. This is the repudiation of everything in Christendom. Because it's not the higher will transform the lower. It, and, and it will fit with that. And I say Shakespeare holds to the four loves view that Lewis presents here. It, it suggests that the most basic thing, the most common thing, the most human thing, is what we share with the animals because we are basically animals. What we call love, <clears throat> sexual attraction is a biochemical response that we actually have no control over even. I fall in love with that girl because she's got the best figure or she's got the right whatever and I, I don't even think about it in terms of best. It's just sort of an animalistic urging by my selfish genes. Quoting Richard Dawkins here, it's, it's an it's a, it's a unconscious drive and desire, just like animals in mating season, you know, where they're rutting and so forth. The, woman, the, the female's in heat and the male come along and they're, okay, there you go. Human beings are exactly the same thing. Lewis will talk about that, by the way, and show how human beings are very different. We can abstain from sex. We can have sex all the time. Animals don't ever do this, never, because it serves no purpose. They don't even desire to do so. It is expression of our free will. So it shows how different human nature is from the merely animal. Uh, anyway, is that helpful at all? But I, I, yes, and it's very much so. And so that hierarchy is, in, I, even in Shakespeare's use, does not get normed by the bottom up. It's the other way around. We are normed. Human society is calibrated by the love of God. And the sovereign, if he's a good sovereign, the king, acts in a, as God would act. And that's what, in, in Measure for Measure, that's exactly what was encouraged. Oh, show mercy. If we were all judged according to our deserts, which one of us would escape judgment? We're going to find Hamlet says exactly that. So yes, this is that central to the place. And, and it shows the Christian character of Shakespeare. Absolutely essential. But don't think that pragmatism is realism because it is a form of realism. It's a form of realism that denies Christian realism. And I would say even classical realism because the, those that are, think that the physiological needs are, are, are the cynics. The, do, the cynics called after uh, the, the word uh, in Greek for dog, kunos, they lie around on the ground and they act like animals. They don't bathe. They dispute that human beings are any different than the animal kingdom. 
think philosophy is a vain thing, politics, etc. So they live outside, lie around on the ground. It doesn't work very well in Canada. You can do it in Athens because it's warm enough, I guess. You can lie around outside, not have a house, not even be clothed. Okay, try that here. It's not working for you. I mean, I see people doing it. It's usually less motivated by philosophy than other needs. But there it's a choice. I'm going to go outside and lie on the ground and act like I'm a dog. Because essentially that's what a human being is. It's a cynical, it's a philosophy. Other comments or questions? Is that helpful? <coughs> I'm going to stop at that for a sec. 